she was tortured. She was beaten until she had open wounds, and her family made her get red hot pepper and stick it in the wounds, stick it in every orifice of her body. You know, they say you do the crime, you have to do the time. On July 28, 2007, about 1 p.m., police received a 911 call about a man lying unconscious on the third floor of Rockaway Queen's apartment. When they arrived, they found 55-year-old Eric Goodridge on the floor, he was handcuffed and his mouth was stuffed with a towel, secured by duct tape, the police realized he was dead, but the police couldn't figure out how he died. They realized his peanut was missing it had been cut off and was nowhere to be found. Bridget Harris was born on June 6, 1991, in Staten Island, New York, to parents Eric Goodridge and Lucy and Harris. Harris immigrated from Liberia to the United States, Eric had several businesses, including an import-export company, a record store, and a travel agency. Lucy already had two children, but went on to have four more with Eric. However, when Bridget was born Eric denied she was his child, he was no longer satisfied with his home life and eventually left the family home for another woman. Lucy was now left with six children, she struggled to raise them alone. In 1983, when Bridget was just two years old, Lucy left her and the other five children and went to Liberia to attend her grandfather's funeral. However, she didn't have a green card or citizenship and despite leaving six children behind, she was not allowed to return to the U.S. The six children bounced around from foster home to foster home. Bridget and her siblings eventually moved in with her father and his wife. In 1990, Eric took a temporary job in Liberia, which lasted for several months. Eric's wife grew tired of him and filed for a divorce. The children were sent to live with their aunt, Eric's sister, and their grandma in Providence, Rhode Island. Bridget's grandma was mean and hateful, she didn't have an ounce of love in her body. She showed favoritism and treated them like slaves, while her cousin sat around doing nothing, she would beat them severely for the slightest things. On one occasion, someone had forgotten to flush a toilet and left a big load floating, which Bridget got the blame for it. Bridget's grandmother went ballistic, grabbed her by the collar, and stripped her naked. Bridget had no idea why she was in trouble while her cousins watched her grandmother take a stick and beat her so hard it split her skin. You would think that was enough, however her grandmother wasn't satisfied with beating her, so she told her to bend over and poured red pepper sauce into her but then continued to cover every part of her that was bruised with pepper. Can you imagine the pain and torture? On another occasion, the grandmother gets angry with Bridget and throws a phone and hits her in the mouth and breaks her front tooth. When she took Bridget to the hospital, she told her to tell the nurses she had fallen off her bike. In February 1994, at the age of 12, Bridget and her siblings went back to Liberia and reunited with their mother. As she believed she would now receive genuine love and acceptance. But she was wrong. After two weeks, Bridget and her siblings began to feel ignored, and Bridget realized that her mother didn't care. Bridget contracted malaria and was in the hospital for two weeks, her mother didn't visit her, she said she had a church revival to attend. Once again, her mother abundant her. Bridget was again living with relatives, but living in Liberia was a culture shock for her and her siblings. As Liberia was going through a civil war that worsened in 1996. Somehow Bridget's mother managed to get documents proving her children were American citizens. They were airlifted back to the U.S. Once back in the U.S., Bridget bounced around from relative to relative and ended up in a women's shelter. She also traveled back and forth between Liberia and the U.S. In 2007, Bridget finally found a place of her own with no one to answer to. She had made new friends and was working as a security guard at J.F. Kennedy Airport. She was no longer in contact with her father. However, after moving into her apartment, her father called. But Bridget had no interest in talking to him and told him to lose her number. Eric's health was failing and in June 2007, he returned to the U.S. for better medical treatment. His daughter Carlene allowed him to stay with her, but Bridget wasn't happy that her father was now living with her sister. Carlene tried to convince Bridget to forgive their father, as he was trying to make amends. 
Although Eric was a well-respected entrepreneur in his community behind closed doors, Eric was a monster. He had put Bridget through years of trauma. He would pretend to play games with her by bouncing her on his knees, then go on to perform acts that no three-year-old should ever have to go through. This animal first penned his daughter Bridget at the age of three, then at the age of four, he forced her to perform acts on him. It continued throughout her childhood and into her teens. He became more and more violent over the years. On one occasion while Bridget was in Liberia, he hid her passport so she couldn't leave and refused to return it. Bridget told her mother what Eric had been doing to her for years. Lucy decided to tell the pastor what Eric had been doing to her daughter, but nothing was done. This God-fearing man, this pastor, looked the other way and suddenly became unavailable. Due to his SoCal busy pastoral commitments, Eric was a well-respected businessman. They didn't want to believe that he was a monster. So she bravely fought him off the last time he tried to rip her, while fighting him off, he dared to ask Bridget what was wrong with her. Now older, Bridget left Liberia for the last time and distanced herself from her father. However, she did feel some remorse as she had left her younger sister behind and knew he was a monster. Bridget talked about it, however, when she talked about it Carlene would change the subject, but now he was back in the US and wanted to make amends. Bridget's sister Carlene invited her for a family dinner and told her that her father would be there and that he wanted to apologize. Bridget agreed to attend the family dinner and took a two-hour subway and ferry ride to Carlene's home in Staten Island, this was the first time she had seen Eric in years and she was immediately angered by what she saw. Eric was bouncing her niece on his leg, just like what he used to do to her as a child, not only did she find that disturbing but her father announced that he wanted to take Carlene's daughter back to Liberia. This triggered Bridget, she was furious, she couldn't let this happen, she loved her nieces and refused to let what happened to her as a child happens to her niece. Bridget and her sister argued about it. Bridget didn't trust Eric and couldn't understand why Carlene would agree to let her daughter go with this monster. However, in Carlene's mind, he was an old sick man and didn't believe he would do what he had done to them growing up. Bridget's mind was now flooded with flashbacks of what she had suffered from Eric and other relatives. He had to be stopped. Bridget wanted to go to the police and report what Eric had done to her, however, the statute of limitations had passed. She searched the web for a solution and came across the case of Lorena Bobbitt, a woman who had cut off her husband's peanut as she claimed he had abused her for years. On Wednesday, July 25, three days before she sees her father. Bridget set up a camcorder and aimed it at herself, she said my name is Bridget Harris and this is the story of my life. Well not the whole thing it will take too long, just for summary reasons, why I'm doing what I'm about to do, why I feel I have to do it, why it must be done, why feel I have to do it, and why I've waited this long to do it. So you can judge me, but before you do, get the whole story that's all I ask. A few days later, Bridget invited her father to her apartment, she wanted to talk to him about the years of abuse he had put her through she wanted him to know that what he did to her was not okay. As a child Eric had always tried to convince her that what he was doing was normal. And this is what all fathers do to their daughters. Bridget told him she remembered the first time he hit her, his response was how do you even remember that you were only three years old? Bridget began to get angry, he didn't appear shocked by what she said and he didn't deny it. Bridget also spoke about when he forced her at the age of four. Eric began to make excuses and was not admitting to what he had done, which was pissing Bridget off. She eventually told him that she had invited him to her apartment to ask him not to take her nieces to Liberia, she told him she knew his intention and he needed to stop and since he wanted to make amends here was his chance. However, Eric denied ever doing anything wrong. Bridget was now in a rage and screaming at him calling him a liar and telling him that he knew what he had done. Bridget realized that he was not going to change and knew her nieces were in danger, she was going to stop him one way or another, she was going to take away his weapon. And that weapon was his peanut. Bridget was going to ensure he would never hurt another little girl again. Eric got up and took a step towards her, but Bridget pulled out her pepper spray and sprayed him in the eyes, they fought and fell on the floor somehow Eric passed out. 
She looked for a way to restrain him, she found some handcuffs she had bought after her friends teased her about her job as a rent-a-car. She put them on him and noticed he was having trouble breathing, she was in a total panic trying to find a way to revive him, so she splashed some water on him and started calling his name. He woke up and started screaming, she decided to gag him she got a towel, stuffed it in his mouth, and wrapped duct tape around his head to secure it leaving large holes so he could breathe. Bridget pulled down his pants she used a scissors at first, when it didn't work she looked for the scalpel she had purchased from eBay about a month ago. To keep him still she pressed her knee on his windpipe. But to her surprise, there wasn't much blood. Bridget knew that the doctors would try to reattach it if found and she didn't want that to happen so she took her father's peanut to the stove and burned it. Bridget snapped back to reality and turned the stove off. She put the burnt organ in a paper towel and called 911, but hung up as she realized she had to leave the apartment first. She picked up the scalpel, pepper spray, scissors, and pills and put them in her backpack, then left and called the police. Bridget called 911 again, but she hung up before providing more information to them. The police and paramedics arrived and performed CPR, but it was too late. Eric was pronounced dead at the scene. The police noticed that Eric's peanut had been cut off, and the scalpel was located next to the body which was determined to be the weapon used. But this was not the cause of Eric's death. Eric had been gagged with a towel, secured by duct tape exposing his nose and eyes, however, the gagging reflex little by little grabbed the towel to the back of his throat which cut off the airway to his nostrils. The cause of death was asphyxiation, two notes were also discovered at the crime scene one said. He wrecked my life, and the other said, at first I blamed myself, but now I know it's not my fault. Police called Bridget and told her that they needed her to come to the police station. Bridget agreed and told them she was a block away, but didn't show up instead Bridget walked past the police station towards the boardwalk pair, and threw away the weapon, and then called her sister to tell her what she had done, and that she was about to hand herself over to the police. Carlene feared she would never see her sister again, so she stopped what she was doing immediately and went to meet her sister. When she arrived Bridget was in a daze, Carlene tried to hold her sister's hand and noticed blood covering both hands and her lap. Bridget had used the scalpel to cut her wrist, Carlene immediately called 911 and Bridget was admitted into Richmond University Medical Center Psychiatric Ward for three weeks and then placed under arrest. Within 36 hours of the murder, Carlene had hired a star defense attorney Arthur Adela, she told the world that both she and Bridget had been victims of an abusive father, he regularly abused them repeatedly from a very young age. Revenge by cutting off his genitals and murdering him. Tonight the other sister, Carlene Goodridge, is taking a brave stand against her dead father. Monstrous man. Preyed upon her, a charge Harris's sister says she knows is true because she also suffered a childhood of being by her father. For all these years, the only reason I can talk about this now is because it's going to help my sister. She needs help. Myself, it started at about four years old, till was about 12 years old. For my sister, probably about three years old, till she's going on 18. Till she's going on 18. This was, this was, this was, this was, a sister breaking her silence today in a bizarre case of family revenge, a case that isn't what it seems. Sadly, she dealt with this for so long by herself when I was right there and I went to her saying, don't speak with her. And did not speak. What the evidence is going to reveal here is that Bridget Harris was the victim of regular and systematic and by her father from the age of three years old right through young adulthood. Do you think she just broke down? We all break down. Of course, we break down with something like this. We broke down a long time ago. At this point, her cries are loud and clear, you know. She needs mental help. She needs to be heard. 
she needs to finally deal with in a healthy way what she's gone through. Anyone who's been involved in the criminal justice system, as long as I have, and anyone's a, a New York City person, you could tell that she's someone who's calling out for help. And as the case will soon be heard by the courts, her lawyer wants to make one thing clear. Her father was a monster. And living with a monster from the age of three is something that you just don't recover from without professional help. However, some family members publicly refuted claims of abuse and disowned Bridget and other family members who communicated with her. As they left court, Harris's family cast doubt that her father abused her. I don't think her father molested her. Even if he molested her, she had all right, all many years to get up and do something about it. Two years after arraignment for second-degree murder, Bridget went to trial in September 2009. She testified in her defense. Bridget stated that she had researched the 1993 castration case of John and Lorena Bobbitt. Bridget argued that her motive was not revenge, but to take away his weapon and to prevent Eric from taking her nieces to Liberia. However, prosecutors maintained that Bridget's actions towards her father showed premeditation on September 30, 2009, the jury found Bridget guilty of the of second-degree manslaughter. One jury reported that none of them felt that she deserved to get any murder charges, so we decided on second-degree manslaughter. Despite receiving letters from seven of the jurors asking him to not give her any more jail time, but this mean old Queen Supreme Court Judge Cooperman sentenced Bridget to a maximum of 5 to 15 years in prison. She was tortured. She was beaten until she had open wounds and her family made her get red hot pepper and stick it in the wounds, stick it in every orifice of her body. You know, they say you do the crime, you have to do the time. Unfortunately for Bridget, it was the other way around. She's been doing time until she did the crime. A sympathetic jury convicted Harris of manslaughter, but they urged the judge to show leniency given the horrific past they heard on the stand. On Friday, the judge sentenced her to 5 to 15 years. With 27 months already spent behind bars, she'll be eligible for parole in about a year. I am very upset about it. I felt she should be left free. I felt that she had enough. She's been abused all her life, and it's time for her to be able to get a fair share in life. In a nearly unprecedented move, the same jurors pleaded for leniency. George Sorakis is one of them. She is not a threat to society that needs to be kept in prison. Charles Marshall, another. If there's anyone who needs something good to happen to her in her life, it is Miss Harris. Most who wrote letters to the judge were moved by what happened before the crime. This young woman has been through a great deal. I remembered the doll that I had. Keep in mind the horrible things that she has been through. I was wearing um, these like daisy printed um, underwear, with yellow flowers. It began at the age of three. Uh, it was constant abuse, whether physical or sexual. Years of torture, years of abuse, she says, at the hands of her father. I would get hit with anything from canes to um, fists, belts. A number of people called him a monster. Yeah. Would you call him that? That's a pretty accurate description. It was always pain and loneliness, always wanting to run away, never having the courage to run away. Consider giving Bridget Harris the lowest possible sentence. Judge, please be lenient. Eight jurors wrote letters on her behalf. Four attended the sentencing. Her lawyer moved as well, handled her case for free. Their reaction immediately after the verdict, uh, they surrounded me on the courthouse steps and just said, please make sure Bridget gets the help she needs from a psychological point of view. And I said, fine, I will when she gets out of jail. And they were very surprised that she was going to go to jail. And they volunteered to do whatever they could to prevent that from happening. Now they've kept their word to help her to be released from prison as early as the law will allow. She made her mistake. The stuff she had went through all her life from a little girl, she, you know, we, I just figured she needed a, a break in life. I just wanted to help her. I mean, throughout her life, she hasn't really had anyone that helped her, so. Miss Harris just needs a chance to start over. Looking back now, knowing what you're facing, hard time, would you have done this? It's not something that obviously was rational thinking, and, you know, I would, I would find other means of trying to bring him to justice. Still, her belief stands. If not stopped, abuse will go on. If he's done it to you, he's going to do it to someone else. Bridget Harris tells me she decided to take the violent action after seeing her father with her young nieces on his lap. She says she believed he was planning to move the children out of the country to live with him and just wouldn't let that happen.
Chris Christie. As far as as early as the law will allow, when is the soon as she could possibly be released? With time served in about two years. Two years. Be before the parole. After serving three years, she was released on parole on the 13th of August, 2012. Since her release, Bridget has worked with the advocacy group Steps to End Family Violence. She also worked for DoorDash delivering food on her bike and volunteered to believe her food to homeless people for an organization called Rescuing Leftover Cuisine, where she picks up leftover food from restaurants and bakeries and delivers it to homeless shelters around the city. In a letter, Bridget wrote, I know second chances don't come easy, and not everyone thinks I should have one. There are family members and friends who no longer speak to me, there are strangers who are scared of me, and in society, there's a lot of rejection, I went back and forth with Amazon for a month applying for a job delivering groceries, after I provided my recommendations and told them my side of the story, they sent me a letter telling me they could not hire me. New York City wouldn't even give me a job picking up garbage and cleaning during the pandemic all the rejection is frustrating and discouraging I feel as if I paid my debt to society, and even though I did my time the world continues to punish me. But if the same happens to you keep pushing forward and never give up. And no it's not your fault.